we're here. This is the uh, the part of the episode where we're going to spend the next half an hour or so, 40 minutes. We're going to be vibing. Uh, we're going to be dividing this up into three different sections, okay? The first section tonight is the whole effing show, guys. What we're going to do is we're going to talk about the build from RVD from roughly February of 06 through May of 06 when he calls out John Cena. Next week is going to be John Cena's run from January through One Night Stand. And then two weeks from tonight, we will be doing the One Night Stand pay-per-view and the immediate aftermath of what happened with RVD. But guys, we're here now. We're starting the whole effing show. Like, I'm going to let you guys tee this one off. When I say the name Rob Van Dam, not necessarily just cornering it down to this 06 run, but like what's some of the first things you guys think of as wrestling fans? Because we're all about the same age. We would have all roughly seen RVD, different entities of his career through different points of our lives. So through different lenses as fans, like where are you guys at in your fandom with RVD? Best gear ever. No one's been, no one's ever been able to replicate that gear either. Well, like he, he truly well, wears one, one of ones. Awesome. He's a guy, and especially after watching his icon biography uh, special and everything, he, with the gear, with the way that he saw the world of pro wrestling, he is one of the most unique artists that the pro wrestling world has ever seen. And it's, exemplified especially when you listen to him speak about it and how he saw things differently and that he was he very much exactly dog he very much went into his <laughs> <laughs> he very much went into his artistic side a lot of the time and he knew when to when to back down but he knew when to push and say no this is what i want to do he clearly marched to the beat of his own drum and he is he is what Matt Riddle was was trying to be and failed to be. Yes. It's because I think RBD just had a little bit more maturity and more tact with how he was doing things. And that's that's how I see like RBD. He's unique. You never see a moveset like him, but everybody tries to try to replicate him in some way. He had the best five star frog splash in the business. Um, I can argue about Montez as a better one, but you know, it, if it wasn't for RBD just doing that it would be great like people still discuss rbd to this day my friend was over my place earlier and i was like yeah i'm watching this rbd he's like oh my god i remember rvd like he still has that aura and that pull um really quick before we go on i was at the the undertaker's hall of fame speech uh that smackdown and obviously the wrestlers came out and everything rvd shows up before they go live it's all about Rob. There is everybody you want on that stage. It's all about Rob. He gets up, gets at the top of the stage, put, does his RVD chant. Oh, he has the whole crowd in the palm of his hands as soon as he makes his way on camera. That's the power of RVD. He was one of my favorites coming out of ECW. Uh, the gear, hard, just following Bo. The when you watch his Icon series, they talk about like having it spray paint or having the the air. The, what's it called? Airbrush. Uh, airbrushed on, um, like all of the uniqueness day to day. How he could change his gear. Agree with all of it. Um, this specific RVD run though starts in February of '06. Um, he, he to qualify for the Money in the Bank ladder match, which was still part of the WrestleMania pay per view at this point. Um, for those of you uh, who are for the new new to the class, um, the the Money in the Bank ladder match used to be on WrestleMania. I personally think it still needs to be. I don't think it needs its own premium live event anymore. But you know, different conversation for a different night. Uh, but to get to this qualification match or to get to the money in the bank, he had to have a qualification match against one Trevor Murdoch. Um, the reason why I bring this up is one, it's a qualification match. He has to win it to get there, but I bring it up because it's Trevor Murdoch guys. He is his run in WWE. Isn't what his career is known best for. He's a tag team champion in WWE. He's done some good stuff there, but it's his career elsewhere. You know, the protege of Harley race, winning the 10 pounds of gold, winning the Crockett Cup, all of the great things he's done after 
the WWE. Um, so more of a less of an RVD question, more of a Trevor Murdoch question. Like, what did you guys think of Murdoch in the WWE, leaving out the current run of him in the NWA? What did y'all think of Murdoch then in the WWE? I really didn't think my like I, I saw him as a tag team wrestler in the WWE. It wasn't until he moved on and went to do what you have stated that I saw him as a singles main guy. I've in the WWE I saw nothing more than and I'll be completely honest, the Marty Gennetti of that tag team. He was a warm body. He was there to put other people over. Like I watched the specific match, this qualifying match. He didn't even get an entrance. I looked, I'm like, he looks like a jobber. I was like, he's gonna like as soon as I saw him on camera, I was like, he's gonna lose. He's gonna lose. Like he wasn't presented well. And sometimes, like what people have shown time and time again, even to this day, sometimes you need to leave the biggest company in the world to show what you can do. And he definitely did. Yeah. yeah. Uh, RVD gets that win. Uh, you know, giving Trevor Murdoch his flowers. NWA, 10 pounds of gold, like blah, blah, blah. He um, sold well in that match, though. I will tell that. He was a great seller in that match for RVD. He does work well. I'll always be a Trevor Murdoch fan. Um, so before we get to Mania, though, he qualifies for Mania. The build to Mania, though, isn't so much about him getting to money in the bank as it was about this feud with Shelton Benjamin guys. Like, him and Shelty were going back and forth so much in 06. And I've got another question here in a little bit after we actually get to the ladder match. Um, in my opinion, I was I was talking to Al earlier about this. Going back, re-watching some of this IC title run, especially Shelton Benjamin stuff in it, was this unfortunately maybe Shelton's biggest push in WWE competing for the money in the bank briefcase, being the IC champion, all of this stuff? Was this maybe his biggest push in WWE? Was this the, you know, the spring and summer of 06? Yeah. Yeah. It's like he, especially after that first money in the bank he was in, they kind of co feed him. Where he's like he's he's the spot guy, like he's he's the Kofi, like Kofi's the Rumble guy, Shelty's the Money in the Bank spot guy. He's the crazy athleticism. I mean, he won the IC title, which is an accomplishment in and of itself. But I think that's where his ceiling hit, and he never got higher than this. Your mic just went out. Who me? Okay, no, it came back. Okay, that was weird. Oh, okay. Did you guys hear that? Did it fade? Yeah, out? it like guys? faded. Just... Okay, oh, that's yeah. weird. Sorry, I'm back. Am I here? Okay. Yeah. I I think Shelton Benjamin's one of the best to do it and not ever get his flowers other than the IC title. Mm. Shelton Benjamin could be on the level if they would have treated him correctly as Bobby Lashley. Like yeah. him playing second fiddle to Lashley in the Hurt business, what's Kind of like, uh, dude, this dude already played second fiddle to one of the be the best wrestler to do it ever, Kurt Angle. Yeah, and what I I do think this run with him and RVD, they had some amazing matches, some very innovative matches, but this was kind of his ceiling. He just couldn't get the elevator to break through the glass. He should have stole the gobstopper. <laughs> right. he played video oh, games in the back yeah i i think that he could have been that that push i always said that Shel uh, somebody like shelton benjamin or mustafa ali were the perfect examples of why wwe needed a world title alongside yeah. the universal title was because they need a working man's championship because those larger than life romans and cena's and you know rollins and you know uh Brock Lesnar's like all of these guys were much bigger in character and ability and stature than say a Mustafa Ali or a Shelton Benjamin. So I always said that's why they needed two world titles was because of people like that. Um, we get to the, uh, the money in the bank moment. And this is kind of the, the cornerstone for the whole reason and the build up to this is because getting the money in the beef break beef briefcase, we see it. Uh, now, Damian Priest is Senor Money in the Bank. 
Uh, Austin Theory had it last year, cashed in on Seth Rollins for the U.S. title. Uh, we've seen Big E's run with the tie when he had money in the bank, when Otis won it and had the back and forth with Miz for his. This is a very important story every year with when and how they're going to cash in and everything that goes into it. This money in the bank match was very different, though, because it was still early in the, the development of it. Um, Edge had won the year before. In this match, you had Ric Flair, David Finley, Bobby Lashley, Matt Hardy. Uh, then you had Shelton Benjamin, Rob Van Dam. And uh, who is the – was it the six or am I missing the seventh? Was John Morrison in this one too? No, nah, it was Morrison. just six. Matt Hardy. It was just the six? Yeah, it was, Matt it Hardy. was promoted as uh, in a promotional. Okay. So it was the those – and they went out there and it was like – it seemed like there were only two or three guys. Shelton, Bobby Lashley, and RVD were the only ones that seemed like they had real like tangible stories to go forward with it. Looking at it – from the you know forty thousand foot view, guys, how do you guys feel about this match in your Money in the Bank matches? Though, like, where does this one rank in that echelon? I wanted Ric Flair to win. Did you? Fuck yeah, dude! I don't know why. <laughs> I just wanted to see Ric Flair win a ladder match at the time. I, I thought, growing up as a kid, Ric Flair. I thought this was his last match ever because I thought he was going to die. <laughs> he almost <laughs> did. I saw that superplex. Yeah, you're like you're putting Flair in a ladder match. Please, God, <laughs> let him win one. <laughs> I don't understand why. I like, I like the fact that Flair's just like, fuck it, I'll do whatever I need to for the business. Like, cool, okay. Um, he suplexed the sixty year old man off the top of a ladder. Yeah, Flair will take bumps, and he always takes those skewed bumps where he turns a little bit and falls on almost his hip versus his back. Yeah. And he always yeah. looks so uncomfortable when he takes them. Um, this one was also spot heavy, man. Uh, it should have started the event, but it did not. Yeah. No, it was what, like 30 minutes into the, the pay per view? It was the third it was match. Like, I it, was, think. it was like the third match in. Yeah. I was like, why would you do that? Um, Shelton runs up the thing and does the springboard plancha out and takes out the whole field of guys. Uh, RVD hits five stars on it. Like, Good match, but maybe not the best money in the bank of all time, right? No, not not really. When I looked at this match, too, it was clear to me that the only story that they were really trying to tell was RVD versus Shelton. It was a very much so, in that match in particular, anything you can do, I can do better. They had an equal amount of high spots, more so than anybody else. Like, Bobby was just a warm body in that entire match. He didn't do much yeah. anything. You know, the story I thought clearly was Shelton versus RVD. And if it wasn't for, who was it in my notes? It wasn't for Matt Hardy interfering with Shelton. Shelton That's cool. beats that match. Yeah. RVD Shelton reposted that... her tweet. Hey, thanks, Rob. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, uh, Kai Tai from Smack Draw? Good to see you, bud. I uh I agree. I think that it was definitely these two time to shine. Um after RVD wins, okay. So RVD wins money in the bank. Custom briefcases, right? Like Best how cool ever. was this tie-dye briefcase? Mr. Money in the Bank, RVD with the yin yang and the dragon and the purples and the greens. Like, how cool was that briefcase, right? Awesome. If I'm not mistaken, was that the first, like, technically the first custom briefcase we got? It was because yeah. Edges was solid black yeah, the edges, whole time. Yeah. Like, in 05, yeah. To see it come out and RVD, RVD kind of not just treated as a briefcase, but more treated as something that means, like, hey, this isn't just a contract. This is the contract. And it matched his gear perfectly. Yeah. I mean, I'll say it. I think RVD is probably one of the better money in the banks. He was. I mean, he and it's also like RVD making a briefcase, something that matches style, is totally believable. Whether it was like on purpose or not, you can see that you could be like, yeah, Rob would do that. Like it, yeah. it totally fit the person that he was. And what I also got from that money big match in particular, I mean, RVD is in in his peak in his prime. He's over like Rover with that crowd. Like, there's a reason WWE keeps going back to that crappy arena called the All-State Arena in Chicago. <laughs> I've been there. It's god-awful. 
but the acoustics are <laughs> unbelievable in that arena. <laughs> like sitting there is a travesty, but being there when the place when the roof blows off that thing is amazing. There's a reason CM Punk's reaction in his return sounds like the the loudest thing you've ever heard. Hey, Fritz is here. Hey, Fritz. Fritz, what's up, Mister Fritz? Good to see you, brother. It's been almost a year since Fretz has been on. He came on to our WrestleMania show last year. So <laughs> nice. I have to circle back through. Um, so after RVD gets the win, um, him and Shelton continue to build that feud. Um, before we get to backlash, though, I have a very important question that I want to ask you, gentlemen. Okay. When I was doing my due diligence, as I say, and I'm flipping over rocks and I'm looking what we're going to talk about, and I put my pieces together for this puzzle. So when somebody listens to this back, we can paint kind of a, uh, you know, a roundabout idea of what RVD was doing at this point. We try to be as streamlined as possible. We knock it down. My screwball question for the night for you while we're going through this is when you look at their, you know, their databases and everything to find their matches, these guys, Shelton and RVD, worked so many house shows together. Okay. So looking at wrestling in 2024, does WWE need to go back to a model where they're doing this many house shows? Ooh. Ooh. Um, I would, love you, brother. would so, so WWE in particular need more house shows like this. I would say in particular with WWE. No. Do I feel like AEW needs more house shows? Absolutely. Um, I think it's all, it depends. It's like, it's wrestler specific on who needs more house shows like the miz uh has said in the past and past podcasts he used house shows as a way to figure out how to talk to a crowd to you know to really work his craft um in becoming you know the hall of fame person that he is um so i don't think they need more house shows but you need, but different wrestlers need house shows need reps it's like in football you know you the only way you get better is you need to get reps that's why college kids transfer all the time because they're not getting time. So maybe the lower you're on the card, the more you need house shows to kind of build up who you are and what you're all about and still have room in the house show to give people the people that they want to see. Um, but the I don't think WWE needs more house shows, but you need to utilize those house shows in creative ways. And sometimes, here or there, make that canon in the storyline of the year. They've done it before. NXT is notorious for doing it. Uh, yes. The last time it was really canonical. AJ Styles f the round and won the U.S. title in Madison Square Garden, and people were like, "What the hell?" And they kept that, <laughs> like they kept that as a thing. So it's one of those things. Like from a wrestler perspective, if you're lowering the card, yes, you need a house show. From a WWE perspective, we can still run house shows. So that's how you make money. That's how you gauge people's popularity. But you can also be creative with it so that the house show becomes a can't miss thing because you never know what might actually happen and where it might actually fit into the grand scheme of the story for it and i i agree with that because that's where samoa joe beat um finn balor to claim his first nxt world title was massachusetts a, was in massachusetts on a house show that no one no one thought about it that joe would actually do it at a house show house shows yeah. can be used to further storylines that are on tv and give people a reason to actually go to a house show other than just saying, hey, you'll see CM Punk. Correct. Well, CM Punk's wrestling for the, the world title at this house show. There might be a possibility CM Punk wins this world title at a house show, so you might want to go. We've seen it happen with AJ Styles. He won a title at a house show. Yep. I agree with all. Al, you've been quiet. Do you, think, do you think WWE needs any more house shows? Um, I keep looking around the computer. <laughs> hey, you have a new camera angle, by the way. Me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I just I, I was wondering something was off. I was like, oh. Yeah, yeah. I have We're my really gonna screw with you guys tomorrow when we switch places. Completely <laughs> 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 like, like, rearranging the studio because I'm gonna be working from home full time. Um. <laughs> Welcome to the life. It's great. I work. From my home. mom does. She loves it and hates it all at the same time. I like it, but it's hard to stay on topic. Like when I'm set down, I have to like sit down and focus on my work or I'll just fucking get five different types of distracted. <laughs> yeah. um, what the fuck was the question? How do you feel about WWE and the amount of house shows they're doing? Should they do more house shows and stuff? I mean, 
I think that they need to be careful with health shows. And I say that because uh, more shows, more injuries. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're still in StreamYard, Matt. I'm just getting fancy with our layouts for 2024. Just wait till I start getting all the Twitch like stuff back up to it, dude. I'm going all out. Y'all just wait. We love you. It's good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Um, I think house shows are cool, but I think, like I said, I think that they need to be limited because you're putting your talent at risk for shows that, what's the phrase that you, that you say that aren't canon? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think house shows are a great place. Uh, for those mid carters that don't get a lot of TV time, and that's where they should that's where they need to put those guys and maybe not have your top talent at a house show. I mean, I know they have to do it to like have a draw, but like they should focus on like, hey, let's build up all of these women that we never show on TV. Yeah, yeah, that's where house shows really do really work well, especially for the lower talent because they can build a more organic fan base, they can be more creative with the crowd i've seen people go to house shows because it's so much fun like they take selfies they they don't rush backstage because they have to you know they have to get their segment out of the way they can right. take their time to really interact with with the fans that's why i think vince was very big on house shows can you draw on a house show can you be interactive with your fans like he had he put a lot of weight on what you did on a house show which made it very important um but i think you know generally it's just more important for about for about person lower in the card so you can start to build your fan base so when you do show up on tv someone out there is like wow i remember my interaction with them at a house show they're awesome and then word of mouth will do the rest i agree i agree with that like i just recently went to an nxt house show and they debuted a couple new talent Ooh. at the house show and they had some pretty decent matches like one's um jonah who's an up-and-coming nxt star I'm excited to see because he's got that catch can wrestler style. I'm excited to see what he does on NXT. And I've got to watch his his debut, quote unquote, at a lonely little NXT house show. <laughs> I love house shows. I love indie wrestling. Um, so I'm, I'm here for it. I think, see, here's the slippery slope, too. And this is the thing that a lot of people, especially fans, don't realize right away. Wrestling shows are fucking expensive, guys. Yes, it like, is. Venues and insurance and, you know, mm -hmm. depending on where you're at, your license. Like, there's so much that go into it. Like, I understand why they're picky on which house shows they do, but I do believe that adding a few more circles and, you know, let your, let your guys make towns, especially your NXT talent and your developmental talent. Like, let mm -hmm. them make the towns. Let them get the reps. Um, but... Leading up to Backlash after WrestleMania, these two guys went back and forth, and Shelty just kept getting the better of him in these house shows, right? And they continued to build that story. Before WrestleMania, they fought for the IC title. The Money in the Bank ladder match, RVD gets the win, but it was like he was always fighting from underneath. He still really couldn't get over Shelton because he was always kind of right there. Then we continue after Mania. He continues losing to Shelton in these, you know, these house shows and stuff like that. We get to Backlash in 2006, okay? The stipulation is it's a winner-take-all Money in the Bank briefcase Intercontinental Championship match. Shelton Benjamin, Rob Van Dam. Guys, like, what do you think when somebody wins Money in the Bank and then they they stipulate it? It's almost like a separate title for the 12 months you hold it. Like, is it okay since, you know, theoretically Shelton didn't win the Money in the Bank briefcase, but he could win this match and take it from the man who did? Are you guys okay with these kinds of stipulations during these Money in the Bank runs? In this sense, looking back at that, I think it worked. Um, Shelton, the, the Shelton's big Achilles here, which I think, really really stopped him from going as as far as he did or going further than what he did was that i watched like the match like a week after wrestlemania where he was on commentary uh for the rvd match uh he comes out looking like the rock and i'm like goodness gracious what are we doing with uh, the hawaiian shirts yeah. and shit? <laughs> yeah. so 
I was like, wearing I was it like yeah. okay. I was like, someone in someone in the back said do this, and he did it. <laughs> <laughs> and then, which is fine, whatever. I get it. You want to try to emulate the rock, which is a great thing to do. But then he got on the mic, and I was like, oh, that's why. And it was still okay. the oval intercontinental title. Yes, too. yes, it was like the attitude era, like <laughs> oval IC title. Sorry, I didn't yeah. mean to interrupt. <laughs> no, it's it's good. Uh, because like he like I, I looked at this, I was like, wow, this screams he looks like the rock. And then I was like, Oh, he can't talk like the rock. And I think that was the that was what the problem was. But he in his diatribe, he made a good thing. He's like, I could have won. Blah 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 blah. He he like he took the money in the bank briefcase from me, which is how the match kind of played out. So now I wanted to get it from him. So I think if you set it up, like any stipulation works if you set it up, if you give it the right framework. I think in this case, it was an easy framework to do, especially how the match played out and where you go from it. Like this is also an immediate turnaround. Eight days after Mania, he's he's putting this on. Yeah, I'm using it as a, I have. I don't like how they've used it in the past. I think this was the first time they used it as like being put on the line also. Mm-hmm. I don't like like Otis and the Miz. I didn't like how that one went about. Like I, I felt like it was pointless. Like it's Otis a top five money in a big match for me too. Yeah. <laughs> the funniest one. It's the, one of the, the best ones ever. I love it. So awesome. Much. That was the one inside Titan Tower, yeah. right? Like it, the it one was, where they started on the ground floor and went up to the, the roof and everything. They did a or living video people. game. Yes. <laughs> it's a living video. And Vince even showed up. The Vince moment is one of the funniest things. Daniel Bryan, AJ busting into Vince's office like freaking children. Who got th- uh, one of the guys got thrown off the roof of the building? A lion. Through Ray Mysterio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Corbin through Ray Mysterio. Like, <laughs> yeah, what is it? Uh, what is it? Otis didn't even catch that money in the bank. It dropped to his hands. Yeah, he was well, like, ooh, I have it. He was laying there and it just kind of fell. <laughs> it fell on him. It was great. I mean, it's... If you're confident enough that you can win, which you have to be that confident going up against the champion, yeah, put it on the line. But it has to have the right story behind it, not just I mean, I'll put my money in the bank on the line, whatever. When you look at money in the bank in and of itself, especially at that time, the money in the bank and the IC title are essentially the same thing. Yeah, it is the same thing. Just one has more of an immediate implication that you're going to be pushed to the top than the other one, which if I do a little bit more looking into it. Money in the Bank might have been the cause of a downfall of the importance of the IC title. When you look at it in the grand scheme of things. Um, but at this time, they're essentially the same thing in a different form. So it would make sense that these guys would battle for who's the next man up? Who's the next? Who's like the next big thing? You're absolutely right. And RVD got the win. You know, he combined them. He was Mr. Money in the Bank and the IC champion. Mm-hmm. A few weeks later, though, we're on Raw, May 15th of 06. Triple H comes out. This is where the, the parts one and part two will start to overlap because we're going to get into the Triple H, John Cena stuff. Triple H is wanting to fight Cena for the title. Vince comes out to open Raw, okay? It's supposed to be the main event. Now it's shifted to be the first match of the night. Vince comes out, though, and he's like, I'm not changing it. You're still going to get your world title match. It's going to be the game Triple H versus John Cena, right? But you're also going to get the Intercontinental title match because for the first time in history, it's a three-on-two. Okay, let me put this up. A (laughs) three-on-two Texas Tornado match for the world title and the Intercontinental Championship, okay? So Triple H, Shelton Benjamin, and uh, Shelton, and Chris Masters are yes. fighting RVD and John Cena. So whoever from the three-person team pins one of these two guys wins that championship. I don't, the balloons are here, peace. Um, <laughs> so if Chris Masters pins... RVD, he wins the IC title. If Chris Masters pins John Cena, he wins the heavyweight title. You see how that yeah. what's, what's going on with that, right? Like that's the gist of it. It sounds like a Russo match, but Russo wasn't even there in 06. He was already in TNA by that point. 
Yeah. Um, so, and this is all Vince. Vince is in the ring and he's like, this is good shit. And he like, he walks off. Okay. Cena comes out, spinner belt, beats the living shit out of Triple H to start the match. Then Shelton Benjamin and Chris Masters both run down there because they're like, oh shit, we beat the shit out of John Cena right now. We could pin him and we could become the champion, right? Yeah, and then yeah. you fucking RVD runs down because he's like, I got to save my boy. But at the same time, it's like, if RVD just didn't show up, he would have never gotten pinned. <laughs> yeah. He could have just let yeah. John Cena get the shit beat out of him and it wouldn't have mattered. <laughs> so long and the short of it, Triple H, double pedigree. He hits the pedigree on RVD. He hits the pedigree on John Cena. Shelton slides in the ring and covers rvd the ref slides down one two triple h pins uh john cena for the heavyweight title as three hits triple h jumps up celebrating but the title goes to shelton benjamin who pinned rvd for the ic title how are you guys feeling about the shenanigans here texas tornado three on two blah 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 blah, blah overbooked match it was so hard to watch <laughs> at some points i got confused what was going on at some the way point, they but, described it was not easy <laughs> no. then i looked at it, i went three on two uh -huh. did someone miss math class like this like <laughs> what like a handicap tornado match i'm like this like i don't know like Fritz von Eric probably did something like this back in the wccw days and it made sense but back hey. in the sportatorium you got girl math and boy math, and you know, this is wrestling math and Steiner this math. Total, like, yeah, three on two Texas tornado match for two different titles, and you win <laughs> based on which person you pin. Like, huh? Yeah. What <laughs> this very much is like it reminds you of like trying to explain Iron Survivor to a non wrestling fan. Yeah, <laughs> that's what there it reminds go. me of King of the I'm Mountain. Like, yeah, I'm yes, like, you exactly. know, what? you know, what? just watch the match, like, <laughs> just watch it, you'll figure it out. But what do you it, mean they're going into a penalty box? This is wrestling. <laughs> I thought the, the idea was to pull the belt down, not put it up. So they got to climb the ladder and hang the belt? Like, <laughs> no just, damn shit. Just, just watch the fucking match. <laughs> match. Yeah, and as, as crazy as that all is, um, it's, the, it's in the details. Like, this match could have been a disaster, but as Vince has famously said, it's all about the finish, and they nailed the story of the finish. Because I had to watch the ending twice, because I actually believed Triple H won, because all your eyes focus on Triple H pinning John Cena. John but if Cena. you look again, Shelton is already on his back. Oh, not Shelton. Um, RVD. RVD's already on his back when Shelton slides in, and the one-second difference is that Triple H has to flip John over to pin him. Yep. And that is the difference of it. So it is crazy designing this match, but they got the story of the finish perfect. 100%. Uh, then we get here, guys. This is the last stop before we get to one night stand. And, you know, King Ricky, I'm, I'm glad you're here with us, brother. It's been a perfect thank you, thank night you. so far. It's been an excellent, excellent episode to kick off season four. May 22nd, 2006. All right. So a week after he loses the IC title, you know, they've gone back and forth. Um, he gets his IC title rematch against Shelton Benjamin. He loses, loses his mind. Beats the shit out of Shelton, hits a five star frog splash. You know, you would think a guy would get booed out of the building for going off like this. The crowd loses it. They still love him no matter what. Like, then he gets to the point at the end of the episode and he comes out and he explains to Cena and he's like, Look, you know, I could call you out at any point I want to. That's what this briefcase says. But instead, I'm going to do it where I've got the biggest advantage. You know, he talks about the home field advantage of going to one night stand having a chance to rewatch it as we round home and finish our VD side of this story, guys, what was it like for you watching him call his shot, seeing him go, you know what, we're going to do it on my terms in my barn, you know, in my match, this is how I'm calling my shot. How did you guys feel about that? Because edges cash in the year before again, very different than Rob's cash in this year. 
Like, how did it feel to you guys as fans rewatching this cash in? It was the first time he had, it's the first time they had used somebody actually name their time and place instead of it being a surprise. And with something like that so early on, and like it's the, it's the you know, Money and Bank's three years old at this time. Um, you can tell that creatively they were just like, we're going to try anything to keep this going. And luckily, this in this instance, it stuck. You know, with RVD kind of going crazy on Shelton and trying to make RVD very heelless kind of tells you how unfortunate it was that Shelton was the heel in this rivalry build. Like, even looking at the Backlash match, Shelton was done a disservice, I think, in the way that the match was orchestrated. They gave Shelton and RVD the classic WWE-style match of go a little crazy, slow it down, help Shelton push it as a heel, slow, 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 go crazy at the end, which worked. It was a good match, but I think for Shelton's sake, as a future, for the future investment in him, it should have been more of anything you can do, I can do better. These guys were two crazy athletic people, probably the craziest athletic people that they had at that time. Let them go nuts, and they didn't do that for Shelton because they wanted to highlight RVD, and I understand that in and of itself, with RVD going to the ECW, especially after watching Icons, we had just done one night stand the year before, and it was an ECW renaissance. E- they they found a way to make ECW hot again years after buying them out. So it would make sense, and Paul even said it, you know, we had RVD at one night stand. He didn't do anything. What can we give the fans that they've never seen? Oh, yeah, let's have RVD main event against John Cena for a world title that he never got marketing it's it's perfect like it was it was the perfect build the perfect storm for one of the most chaotic scenes in the history of pro wrestling you're absolutely right the these two guys at the time were were the most innovating and like you just said the most athletic the match could have went it could have been better it was good i'm not taking nothing away from either of them but when he said he was cashing in money in the bank at one night stand, that right there as a kid goes, I have to watch this. I remember yes. watching the first one because my dad, me growing up, I didn't know ECW from the hole in the ground until the resurgence of the one night stand. And my dad's like, you have to watch this. So to hear Rob Van Dam was one of the big guys behind the scenes going, we should try it. There's money to be made there, Vince. Let's. Let's give it a go. And then getting injured, not being able to participate in the first one to basically getting his flowers and his comeuppance at home. Yeah. Like for the biggest title at the time in the world. And you're going to, you're going to do that match at one of the smallest venues you can find. Very intimate. 2300. Yes. <laughs> not a big place. Not a big venue. <laughs> Very intimate world title match. I, I, I just thought it was cool watching Rob Van Dam go for a title. Yeah. Let alone watching him win that. And we'll get to that. And then when we, when we cover one night stand. Yeah. The whole show the, from month from WrestleMania up until he called his shot and said, I'm not going to jump you from behind. I'm not a coward like Edge was the past two years. I'm going to look you face-to-face and say I could beat you. Was was perfect storytelling. Yep. Yeah. And believable because of who Rob was backstage. Yeah. Well, go ahead, Ricky. You got something? Uh, no, I'm good. I'm good for right now. Nothing else I can add to that. Like, it's just, it's a, it was a, Good build for 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 the right time they capitalize and you can tell looking back at this they were RVD especially even when coming out for his first match against Trevor Murdoch to qualify RVD is a star he's the biggest guy on that brand right now I mean Austin knew it Taker knew it that's why they jobs for RVD they knew talent when they saw and they wanted to give this guy everything in the world um, and unfortunately which you guys I know we'll get to at times RVD got in his own way. Yes. <laughs> yes. 
big part of the story and uh yeah. you know it's it's good radio right we got to tease it a little bit so you know what's coming down the pipes i would even go further back to say rvd kind of gave the hardcore title adrenaline shot there when he held it he did when he first came back the invasion angle yeah that was like yeah. part like the matches him and jeff had like it's it's sometimes hard to go out and find a bad RVD match. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're you're absolutely because he back. sells like no one sells. He moves like no one moves. It's hard to find. Go, you know, that's just a shitty RVD match. <laughs> like, <it's hard> to <laughs> There's not very many of them, my friend. Exactly, and no one still can replicate his entire move set. We've seen people do a split legged moonsault, and that maybe is the only thing that people can replicate. Anything else that RVD does is totally RVD completely and still to this day he's still doing so much of it even in yeah even in 2024 so best entrance song in 2024 by the way pantera walk yeah coming back to that <laughs> i could say that right there i popped for just that <laughs> all right guys that's it we made it uh ricky this is the opportunity man uh put yourself over tell everybody where to find you what you got going on oh, oh my god this is, might be a little bit long because as you probably know well a lot of things have come our way in a very, very positive light. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, this is King Ricky Rose, your general manager of Wrestle Attic Radio Podcast Network and the lead host of Kings of the Rings Podcast, the newly nominated Kings of the Rings Podcast, because we have been nominated by the Sports Podcast Award as a 2024 finalist for Best Wrestling Podcast. Um, so it's it's been... It was fantastic to wake up to that a week from Christmas, to get that accolade um so the links to all of that stuff are going to be at kltr underscore podcast on pretty much all the social media outlets wrestle attic radio is attic underscore wrestle on twitter and wrestle attic radio everywhere else uh kings of the rings podcast does a live show every wednesday night at 8 p.m eastern on twitter twitch and youtube simulcasting um on on those pages for kings of the rings and wrestle attic radio so you can find us pretty much uh all over the place uh, you can find me personally uh, now that I'm actually back from back on social media. I took a one year hiatus, actually, uh, at Ambassador Biggs, B I G Z, Ambassador Biggs. Uh, you can find me there on all social media outlets as well. And obviously, thank you, Boss Bitch Allison and Will Gray and Ginger Ninja, my new best friend, um, for, <laughs> for allowing me to return uh, to this show and, you know, really reminisce about about RVD and, and the scraps with you guys. It is always an absolute pleasure. And there's an open invitation for uh, all all of you to uh, come on WrestleLatic Radio as well as Kings of the Rings podcast whenever you guys want. We love you, brother. Always. Love you guys too. Jax, what's new and exciting for you in 2024? Well, there's a lot of new and exciting stuff. But you can find me anywhere and everywhere on Rivet City Radio and Off the Top Media. Tuesdays for nerdy news right here on River City Radio. Then we do NXT on tap. We review NXT on Off the Top Media alone with a slew of other podcasts that I'm on. And if you'd like to know all about that, follow me on Twitter at Jacksbo2020. It was a pleasure meeting you, and I hopefully we can do this again. Oh, absolutely. Oh, He's yeah. gonna be coming on trivia soon too. We got a lot. I am. Of that I am very excited for that. Yes, I do love me some trivia. I used to host trivia at a bar for a couple of years. So nice. <laughs> Al, you're up. What's up? Um, trivia will be returning on Thursday. We're gonna change it up a little bit. I think I'm gonna reformat uh, trivia a little bit. Uh, also, trivia will not be every week. I'm going to attempt to alternate it with uh, finally launching the Boss Bitch Power Hour um, TBD on that. Uh, thanks to Metal Mike, I did get a J Uso figure. So once my life stops being a crazy mess, uh, I will be starting back the Heel Support Group. Thank you, Scouts. Uh so we're going to, my new feature is going to be, since all of my heels are not heels anymore, they are faces, we are going to do a little spinoff and uh, do a, as the bloodline turns. Uh, <laughs> That's awesome. So I finally have a, a rock, a Roman, a Jimmy, and a Jay. Uh, I don't need Solo. It's fine. And we've got an Austin Theory. Oh, yeah. And we've got well, a Vince a McMahon. 
Oh, oh yeah. she's getting a very new special figure when she comes here. Yeah, she is. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, this is my personal. I went through my personal collection just to find this very special figure for yeah, you. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I bet it's a Kenny Omega figure. No, you're already getting a shirt. You have to wear one time. So. Yep. <laughs> we'll see. It's just uh, my hero. <laughs> You can follow me on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter at just a girl nine one eight. Uh, yeah, I think that's all. I, I got. Uh, be kind to others, people. Uh, winter is hard for everyone. It is uh, cold as hell up in New York, by the way. It's cold as here in Florida too. It's cold in Tennessee, but like, I don't know. Just don't be an asshole. Like, it's not that hard. Just don't be an asshole. 49 degrees right now here. Oh, you're so lucky. <laughs> I wish it was 49. <laughs> it is 35 degrees right now. Yeah, same here. All right. Uh, let me go through my list and then we can go home. Um, first and foremost, always follow my friends. Follow the crew at Creation World. Follow Off the Top Media. Follow everybody that's at fine-tuned wrestling follow everybody at for the you know the free birds follow all of my friends just follow everybody um follow us if you check the links in the descriptions down below you'll see the instagram the x facebook you'll find everything you'll see the writing profile for last word on sports go to click all those links follow like subscribe everywhere you do anything the Discord link is also there. It gives you a direct link to all the hosts and producers of Rivet City Radio and off the top media. We also have a merch shop. If you click the link, it says Botch Bots and Share Shots and off the top merch at my spread shop. You'll be able to get all of your sweet Botch Bots and Share Shots, Rivet City Radio and Rivet City Radio and off the top media merch. Uh, most importantly, though, if you have Amazon Prime, you get a Prime gaming subscription. Use it, give it to us, give it to Off the Top, give it to Creation World or the Wolfpack Podcast. Give it to any of our friends as long as Jeff Bezos doesn't get it because he's got too much money. Um, thanks. You're in New York. Uh, yeah. I didn't um, see, yes, I am. I'm, I, I'm born and raised on Long Island, New York. So uh, not where MJF is from because MJF's a pussy, but whatever. That's just a, that's just a Long <laughs> Island. That's a Long Island rivalry thing. So don't take too much time. 19 in Colorado. Guys. So it's cold there in the Rockies. Yeah, Coors Light. Um, but yeah, I, I am on Long Island. Uh, so yes, New York based uh, podcast working here. And Scouseth in Staten Island. So <laughs> I, I, will, I, will, I will hold my tongue, not neighbors. Um, I will hold my tongue <laughs> on Staten Island. <laughs> not neighbors at all. There's a couple of bridges that separate us. That's it, guys. We did it. All the damage was done. Y'all got anything for the class before I talk real fast? Wow, all you. No. <laughs> not you, Penny. It's my turn to talk. <laughs> <laughs> Now as we close another episode of Black Spots and Share Shots, I'm taking a minute to thank you for listening. Remind you to go wherever you do anything on the internet. Like, follow, subscribe, unsubscribe, then subscribe again. Leave a comment telling me how great I am or how terrible I sound. Either way, it helps the algorithm. It helps find new listeners. If you're feeling really generous to be one of the VIP people, head over to patreon.com and donate to the Rivet City Radio Podcast Network. You get some fantastic swag. We get some fantastic guests. It's a win, win for King Ricky Rose, everybody's favorite Ginger Ninja Jaxpo, and the boss bitch Al. I am the Will Gray. It's 2024. Season four is here, guys. Thanks for stopping by and listening, my people. Bye. Goodbye.